Among my letters one morning, I found the following invitation. Miss Lily Kensington Gore requests the pleasure of Master Grossmith's company. <laughs> they always think I'm a boy. To a juvenile party. January the 12th, half past four. I accepted the invitation and was received at the door by our hostess, Mrs. John Kensington Gore, who said, Put on this sealskin and imitate a bear by crawling in along the floor. I did so, whereupon a lot of rough boys numbering about twenty-four seized hold of my coattails, which they positively tore. And I have been obliged to abandon that coat for evermore. The first juvenile who particularly attracted my attention was Master Johnny Holler. He was evidently a very rude boy. He said to me, Auntie will be so pleased you have arrived, I heard her say you will do to sing comic songs until the conjurer comes. One little boy was so fat that he could not stand up for two minutes together. His mamma was so tired of picking him up that she finally placed him upon a chair, where he sat throughout the night with a genial smile and stiff legs. Then I noticed Miss Pamela Winifred Millicent sagely green. She was dressed in peacock blue with pattern of yellow flowers. She wore a wreath of poppies round her tousled auburn locks, and seeing that she looked pale and quiet, I said, are you not well, dear? Her response was, Quite well, I thank you, but I'm aesthetic. Master Temple Barley evidently had a new watch, for he said to everybody in turn, Would you like to know what time it is? That clock on the mantelpiece is nearly a quarter of a minute slow. One little lady amused herself with looking alternately at a new sash and a surprise fan, which came out of a bunch of roses with sudden jerks. Captain Dordley invited himself because he was so frightfully fond of children. Miss Smiles invited herself also because she knew so many children's games. These two grown-up guests sat upon the staircase the entire evening, and the only attention that Captain Dordley paid to any of the children was when Master Johnny Holler, the rude boy, went out on the stairs and exclaimed, Aren't you two spoons? Captain Dordley then accidentally dropped his hand with some force upon Master Johnny's head. The girls and boys commenced to play the usual games in the usual way. When of musical chairs they'd had enough, they had puss in a corner and blind man's buff. Then they danced round the mulberry bush, the mulberry bush, the mulberry bush. Then they danced round the mulberry bush in a highly intelligent way. Until there was an announcement of Tay. When the juveniles proceeded downstairs, pitter patter, pitter patter. And then the young people sat down to their tea. The girls were as dainty as dainty could be. And one of the boys ate at least twenty-three. Of the new currant bun of old England, the new indigestible bun. Some things are remarkably suited for food. The clown on the top of the twelfth cake is good. But if you've a wish to be ill, then you should. Try the new currant bun of old England, the new indigestible bun. After tea, for the supposed amusement of the little guests, Mrs. Kensington Gore organised a small juvenile concert, performed chiefly by her own children, whom she termed, without prejudice, marvellous musical geniuses. After Miss Sylvia and Miss Cordelia had played the duet from Zampa with the usual difficulties... <laughs> of commencing together and subsequently of keeping in time together, Miss Emmeline Rosa sang a little song entitled Oh, If I Were a Little Bird Upon the Greenwood Tree in a small, sweet voice. Oh, if 
I were a little bird upon the greenwood tree, how happy, how happy, how happy should I be? Oh, if I were that little bird throughout the live long day, I'd chirp, I'd chirp, and then I'd fly away. I'd chirp, I'd chirp, and then I'd fly away. I'd chirp, I'd chirp, and then I'd fly away. I'd fly away. I'd fly away. Then young Master George sang the same song as a contrast in a loud, cracked voice as follows. Oh, if I were a little bird upon the greenwood tree, how happy, how happy, how happy should I be? Oh, if I were that little bird throughout the live long day, I'd chirp, I'd chirp, and then I'd fly away. I'd chirp, I'd chirp, and then I'd fly away. I'd chirp, I'd chirp, and then I'd fly away. I'd fly away, I'd fly away. Master Lawrence Randall was next persuaded to recite My Name is Norval, but unfortunately, soon after he commenced, a street piano organ began to play Grandfather's Clock, much to his discomfiture. <coughs> my name is Norval. On the Grampian Hills, my father feeds his flock. A frugal swain, whose constant cares were to increase his stores and keep his only son, myself, at home. For I had heard of battles, and I longed to follow to the field some warlike lord, but I stopped, short, never to go again when the old man died. Oh! Beg your pardon. After some dancing, the supper suddenly appeared, and then the supper gradually disappeared. Uncle Walter arrived late, and as a conclusion to the entertainment, regaled the juveniles with the following song. There's something that I want to tell to you There's nothing very singular in that Perhaps my observations are not true There's nothing very singular in that There are some things that really should not be In this land of freedom where we all are free I have a pair of eyes with which I see There's nothing very singular in that John Singleheart, a lady, did adore. There's nothing very singular in that. She was all his fancy painted her and more. There's nothing very singular in that. She married someone rich and twice her age. John took a curacy to cool his rage. But eventually went upon the stage. There's nothing very singular in that. I called a cab one day in Portman Square. Oh, there's nothing very singular in that. The cabman wanted nearly twice his fare. <laughs> there's nothing very singular in that. A member of the club at which I dine went off with my new hat at half past nine. I brought away a coat that wasn't mine. There's nothing very singular in that. To listen to this song, you're very kind. There's nothing very singular in that. I know you'll turn it over in your mind. There's nothing very singular in that. If I knew another verse to sing, I should. But as I don't, I couldn't if I would. I feel I have not done a bit of good. There's nothing very singular in that.